What are your best tips for boosting confidence? Confidence is this thing that you have to maintain in, in a business that is designed to undermine your confidence at all turn, at every turn. Um, I think I just was actually talking to somebody yesterday who was having um, a crisis is too strong a word, but she's at a crossroads about something. And I said, you know, here's your pro here's the problem we're talking about. I said, I think you need to do something about that problem, the dilemma every day. Do something every day, even if it's 20 minutes, even if you feel like you're not making progress, you're repeating yourself, you're digging yourself a hole, do something to get at that issue every day. Because confidence is so fragile. There are people who are confident for no apparent reason. You know, there are. They just have it. And they can't be dissuaded. And God, that's a gift. That's a fantastic gift. Most of us who are mere mortals are not, are not like that. And so, uh, you know, I, back in the day when we used to go in for in-person auditions, which I don't know if that's ever coming back, but you'd, you know, you'd arrive at the audition, you'd pull up to the gate of the studio, and you'd say, I'm going to meet so-and-so in this building, and here's my appointment. They say, oh, you're not on the list. <laughs> Okay, so they got to call the office. So that's confidence number one, going down the tubes. I'm not on the list. Then you get on the list. Oh, yeah, yeah, they've got you. So you got to park in that structure. It's like four blocks away. So you got to go park in that structure. And you're wearing a suit because it's a, it's a role that requires that. And it's like 100 degrees out. And you got to walk the four blocks in the blazing sun. And then you get there. And by the time you get there, you're a mess. It's so, it is designed, it's like a minefield to undermine your confidence. And so um, I'll tell you uh, the best story that ever happened to me, and it has to do with this issue. I was, um, I, was getting, I was getting out of the shower one morning. I get a call from my agent, and they said, can you be in Century City at 10 o'clock? And it was, uh, or whenever it was, it was, I literally just stepped out of the shower and it was in, I live in the Valley, I live in Studio City. It's rush hour in the morning. I said, well, he said, it's a movie. It, somebody must have fallen out. You're next on the list. I don't even know what it is. Just go. There'll be sides for you there to look at. So I'm like, getting ready. <laughs> I'm getting in the car and I'm trying to get through traffic and park and, and, and talk about confidence. I don't know what's going on, right? So I get there, I see my sides, I look at them, I read through it once, and the casting director says, Michael, are you ready? I went, sure. I just said yes. I think that's a big part of confidence. I just said, yes, I'm ready. I wasn't ready. I wasn't even remotely ready. But I said yes. So I went into this room, and again, another big room. I didn't know anything about this project. First person I see is Robert Duvall. Oh, wow. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is, what, what is this? I don't even know what this is. I have this long scene. And in those days, they didn't expect you to be off book. You could still have the script with you. Now everyone has to be, you know, off book, letter perfect, all that stuff. But I had the script and I literally had just gotten it. So I get through to the, I get to the end. It's very quiet in the room. And the director, whose name was Billy Graham, by the way. Oh. Okay. William Graham, a fantastic guy. He looked at me and said, that was perfect. I said, really? <laughs> I said, that's not a word we hear too often in rooms like this. He said, no, that was perfect. Great. I said, well, okay, thanks guys. And I left. I'm thinking, what the heck just happened? I didn't have time to have my confidence shaken. I just had to get it done. I said yes. And I did it, and the instincts we talked about earlier just kicked in. I had a take on it. Oh, but the other thing was, it was an Israeli character, so I had to have an accent. Happened to be that my kids at the time, when they were young, had an Israeli nanny. And so I was very familiar with it. And I'm good with accents. I was very familiar with it. So I did it. And they called back, I don't know, a week or so later. They want to have you back. They have to call back. And I'm thinking, oh, man. If I go back, I'm going to probably blow it. So, no, I'm not going to go back. I, I was a crazy decision. I said to my agent, make up something, lie, say I'm working. I'm available for the job, but not for the callback. 
I don't know what possessed me. And uh, I got it. It was a it was a oh, it was a, a Showtime movie with Robert Duvall. We shot in South America. It was an incredible project. Movie wasn't that great, but it was a great experience. And working with him was a great experience. But it was that level of not knowing enough to be scared, to be frightened, to let it get in your head. We all get in our heads. Actors get it, but people do. Human beings do. It's 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 so actors will get in their heads about something and. We feel we have to be perfect. We have to be. I'm working with somebody now who's who's kind of new at this, but she's really extraordinary. And I've had to sort of cure her of being a perfectionist. I said, "We're not. I'm not interested if you miss that one word. It doesn't matter. If the take is great, if you like it, if we like it, that's what we're going to go with." And so, once you free yourself of perfectionism, uh, I think that lets opens the door for a little bit more confidence. When I work with, I've worked with a lot of people who are dancers and athletes in particular, who are fantastically good for acting because they are disciplined. They know they have to have training. They know they have to know what they're doing. They can't just wing it and just, oh, I'm feeling it this way. They have to, they actually know that they need coaching and all that stuff. And so, but they are perfectionists. Dancers and athletes are perfectionists when they transition into acting. And so it's, a quite, it's just getting them confident enough to know that they can be imperfect and it's cool. You know, sometimes when an actor drops a line, like right now, you go, oh, what just happened? That's interesting. You know, sometimes when you think, oh, what's my line? What's my line? What's my next line? But you've, you've had a pause. It lets us in. We go, oh, what's going on? That's cool. What? So it, it's. I, I do think confidence is directly related to a sense of perfectionism, and if you have to be perfect, your confidence is going to be undermined at all times. If you accept the fact that imperfection, as long as it shows fidelity to the story, to the script, and to your character, is fine, it's much easier, and it's kind of what we're after anyway, I think. We talked about Tom Cruise earlier mm -hmm. and sort of this, this composite of someone that has unshakable confidence and is going to get the job done. But then you think about a character like a Paul Giamatti or <laughs> Ileana Douglas, yeah. who they, they show in facial expressions, micro, you know, like a little bit of doubt. And then we like them even more. Of course, yeah. Because they're like, oh, I see me in that character. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, Paul Giamatti is a great example because. He's just got that face. He's got that face that is only, and the voice, and he's very good. He's very, very good. But as I said earlier, I do think that faces and worlds, I was telling this young woman yesterday who I'm working with, who's got some confidence issues. I said, you know, if you think about it that way, like what world do you fit in? You don't fit in every world. I don't fit in every world. What world do you fit in? And I didn't get you didn't get that role because well, there's a lot of reasons you don't get a role. You maybe you didn't do a good audition. Maybe your agent isn't significant enough to really fight for you. Maybe uh, you're too old for that character because he or she has to be matched to another person who's a little too young, a little young. There's all kinds of reasons, and most of them are optical. Most of them are like how you look. And, and so, again, we get back to that blink of an eye thing. So, particularly with self-tapes now, I say, you know, you've got to, you have to somehow be there, present, and right at the first frame. Absolutely, the first 10 seconds are the most important. I had a, a woman who is a, um, um, I won't name her, she's, but she's a very significant casting person, head of casting at, at a network. Who came to my class? She was great. She was, and somebody asked. And so, like, if there's a lead role in a in a television series, I don't know how many people are submitted. It's thousands, probably. And then they get down, they winnow it down, and then maybe she sees the last fifty that have gotten through the callback process. Maybe it's even a smaller number than that. I don't know. And somebody asked, "How do you, uh, like, what's the process after that?" And she literally took out her phone. She went. And everybody gasped because at that point, 
She knows everybody's good. Who's the right fit? Who looks right? It's kind of that. I just cast this pilot that I produced, and it was like we had people, because we had a very good casting director, so we didn't see people who weren't good. We all, everybody we saw it for the major parts was very good. So it wasn't about that. It was about like, oh, she's great. Doesn't fit. It doesn't work for this reason or that reason. So it's a lot of that. It's a lot of that. And, and, and that sort of uncertainty and that capriciousness, it's very capricious as a profession. And it's kind of borderline abusive as a profession, to be perfectly honest, particularly now when an actor gets a 12-page, three-scene self-tape with 24 hours to turn around, and he or she has a work shift that night, and they have to memorize it, and they have to film it, and they have to upload it, and it has to be great. Come on, that's crazy. It's crazy, but it is what, that's the new normal. That is actually the normal now. They're trying to, uh, they've changed that a little bit in the UK, and I, I think it's smart. They've given people, they, they, they send all these, these tapes out that are, it's impossible to do what they're asking for some people. You know, 12, 13 pages, when a show itself is 60 pages, you're asking people to film a quarter of the show they, overnight, and it has to be great. In, in the UK, they're doing a thing, they uh, four page maximum with a four day minimum. And then if it's a six, then it's a six page, they have a whole formula so that it's not, otherwise it just gets to be crazy. And it's a good point. You said a work shift. Most actors have yeah. flexible jobs that they're doing at night and things. Yeah. And so, yeah, you can't be totally it's, put it's together. It's become, that aspect of it has become harder because it's not personal anymore. You're not walking into the room and developing a, maybe a relationship with that office that you've been in six, seven times. They like you. They keep bringing you back. There's an energy in the room. There's a person-to-person -person energy that simply can't be replicated on Zoom. But that's what it is right now. That's, that's the world we're living in, and it is what it is. I'm glad to be on the 17th hole <laughs> with that.